Regardless if you're a sports fan, when you think of legendary basketball players, I'm sure one of the first names to pop up is Michael Jordan. This 6 foot 6 machine was probably at his most popular in the baggy decade that is the 90s, joining the Chicago Bulls in 1984 when he was just 21 years old. He played until 1993 when he announced his early retirement to pursue a career in minor league baseball, then returned to the sport he was destined to play in 1995. After winning three back-to-back -back championships, Jordan retired for the second time in January 1999. He announced his comeback on September 25th, 2001 with the intention to donate his salary to help victims of the 9-11 attacks that happened 14 days prior. On April 16th, 2003, Michael played his final NBA game. He received a three-minute standing ovation that night and walked away from his sport after winning six NBA championships with the Chicago Bulls, winning five MVP awards, and having created the incredibly successful Air Jordan brand with Nike. On top of all that, he starred in the greatest live-action animated basketball film that changed the way humans view cinema. Move over Citizen Kane because it's movie night here at Night Gaze Video, and we're renting out the film that every 90s kid loved, Space Jam. To find out how Space Jam was conceived, we must first go back to the 80s. Michael Jordan was becoming more and more popular, and so he partnered with Nike to create Air Jordan. With the release of Air Jordan 3, Spike Lee directed a commercial featuring Jordan and Mars Blackman, a fictional character he played in his film She's Gotta Have It from 1986. To Lee's surprise, this commercial blew up and is considered a landmark in the advertising world. After running its course with that ad campaign, Nike wanted to do something different. Creative director Jim Riswold saw how this duo blew up and started thinking about other fictional characters that Jordan could be tied to. That's when he got the idea to pair the most popular basketball player at the time with the most popular cartoon character. No, not that one. Yes, that's right, Bugs Bunny. This concept helped develop the Hair Jordan campaign that Rizwal led at the Whedon Plus Kennedy Advertising Agency that also worked on the Just Do It campaign and those awesome Old Spice ads. Warner Brothers was excited about the idea, but had concerns in regards to how Bugs would be portrayed since the classic 40s version wouldn't be considered politically correct. This means they needed a director who could make Bugs Bunny work while still keeping the same spirit of the character. Joel Pitekill was offered to direct the commercial, but he initially declined because of his issues with the old school appearance of Bugs Bunny. After many debates with the studio, Warner Brothers granted Pitekill's wish to modernize the look of the character. Taking six months to make and spending around $1 million, the 60 second ad was released on January 26th, 1992 and was an immediate smash. It was the Super Bowl's most talked about spot, so of course, another commercial followed the next year that featured Marvin the Martian as the antagonist. Following the incredible success from the commercials, Michael's manager, David Falk, teamed up with CBS executive Ken Ross to pitch a Michael Jordan movie with Bugs Bunny. Even though Jordan had already turned down multiple movie roles throughout the years, Falk knew that because of Jordan's acting capabilities, the only role Jordan could ever play was himself. However, it seems like the commercial success wasn't enough since Warner Brothers initially turned down the idea, even though the head of their consumer products, Dan Romanelli, thought it would be a great merchandising opportunity. Executive Vice President of Production Lucy Fisher saw the commercial and thought it was a fantastic dynamic of characters. Her support of the concept compelled Chief Executive at Warner Brothers Bob Daly to greenlight the project. Director of Ghostbusters, Stripes, and Kindergarten Cop Ivan Reitman joined as a producer and came up with a basic idea of the Looney Tunes teaming up with Michael Jordan to defeat the Monstars in a game of basketball. When Jordan retired in 1993, the studio had no choice but to shut down the project. It was left to dust for two years until Jordan announced his return to the NBA. Rather than stressing about whether to mention his retirement in the script, the writers used it to their advantage and worked it in the Jordan story. In the spring of 1995, Joe Pitekill was hired to direct the feature since he had experience with the Hair Jordan ads. At this point, he had also directed the famous Nothing But Net commercial with Michael Jordan and Larry Bird. He got along and worked well with Jordan, so it only made sense that he directed him. However, for some reason, the studio brought Pitekill late into the game and only gave him a few months of prep before they needed to start principal photography. This may sound like a 
long time for some of you, but keep in mind that Pika still needed to cast the rest of the characters and plan out visual effects since they were trying to break boundaries by digitally combining live action and animation. According to the commentary, a chunk of the film was being animated before Pika was brought on board, so when he saw what had been done, he wasn't satisfied with the design since they went back to the classic look of the characters, even though it then fit the tone of the pitches he had done for Nike. Pika had to take excerpts from the commercials and send them to the animators for reference. This led to Tony Cervoni becoming the animation director since Pika noticed he knew exactly the type of cartoon he was looking for. Ivan Reitman even called Robert Zemeckis to get some of his advice on this topic since he had done the revolutionary film Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Zemeckis' advice to Reitman was, and I quote, Don't do it, it nearly killed me. So yeah, they needed all the time they could get. Speaking of Who Framed Roger Rabbit, Brightman and Pitka were aware of the comparisons the film would get, which is why they set out to try to make the two films as different as they could. The goal was to have Space Jam be more temporary, punchier, and fresh, while Roger Rabbit set to pay homage to the classic cartoons while keeping the story a little more serious and realistic. Also, may as well say this, but neither film was the first of its kind to combine 2D animation with live action footage. This hybrid has existed as far as the early 1900s with the enchanted drawing. Disney also made some shorts called Alice Comedies which did the same thing. Who Framed Roger Rabbit was simply revolutionary for its technical achievements in inventing many techniques still used in CG heavy films. And Space Jam simply did the same but with updated digital technology. Once on board the project, the first thing Pika did was look through the script, obviously. He was friends with Spike Lee because of their commercial collaborations, so Lee approached Pika to polish the script. Pika thought it would be a great idea, but Warner Brothers stepped in and refused to let Lee work on the screenplay since they were upset with him for having his friends finish funding for Malcolm X. For some reason, Warner Brothers didn't like that Lee did that, which led to the two never working again. Another issue Pika ran into was casting. Because of Michael Jordan's connections, casting the basketball players wasn't that difficult. Larry Bird was a clear choice because of the McDonald's commercial and the relationship he had developed with Jordan since then. However, Pika's issues came in regards to casting any minor characters. For the role of Jordan's assistant, Stan, Pika's first choice was to cast a Michael J. Fox, but the studio rejected this idea. His second choice was to cast Chevy Chase since the two had worked together on a Doritos commercial, but the studio also didn't like that. Finally, they went with what I think was the best choice, Wayne Knight, who was in the middle of his Seinfeld fame. Hello, Jerry. <laughs> Hello, Newman. Another major cast member they got was the comedy legend Bill Murray. He was originally only supposed to be in this one golf scene after refusing to do any green screen work, but while on set, Murray asked Pitka how they were filming the actors with the animated characters. Pitka told Murray that they would have the actors in green suits interacting with Jordan, which sparked his interest again since he knew he would interact with something on camera, so he agreed to do it. This led to him being written into the ending, even though they were in the middle of production. That likely explains how incredibly random the scene was. If it was anyone else, I'd probably find it annoying, but the idea of Bill Murray crossing over into the Looney Tune world is too good for me. Uh, Mr. Murray, uh, something's really been bugging me. Yeah? Just how did you get here, anyway? The producer's a friend of mine, just had a teamster come and drop me off. Yeah. Uh-huh. Well, that's how it goes. For the basketball players, they brought in Muggsy Boggers, Larry Johnson, Charles Barkley, Patrick Ewing, and Sean Bradley. They were originally going to use George Muirzen since they needed a mix of short and tall monsters, but he went back to Yugoslavia for vacation and the studio was never able to get a hold of him. Thankfully, Sean Bradley was able to come in at the last second to replace him. Principal photography lasted for six weeks in the summer of 1995. Since Jordan was set to return to the NBA the following season, Warner Brothers built a gym for him on set so he could train when he wanted. Jordan was known to film in the morning, work out during lunch, film until the end of the day, then go work out again afterwards. Sometimes he would bring other players like Reggie Miller or even Joe Pitka to play on court with them in between setups. One day, Jordan asked the director why are you never on my team? To which Pitka responded by saying, because I want to see the ball every once in a while. Since Jordan had lost his previous championship, he was determined to work harder than he ever had, so instead of attending script conferences or pre-production meetings, he would go work out. Thankfully, all this practice paid off since Jordan would go on to win three consecutive championships. For the scene where Michael is playing baseball, Michael originally struck out and went to the bench where he meets Stan. Pitka felt they needed a little more to show Michael as an athlete 
athlete, so he sketched out a scene where the umpire is calling every pitch, even if it was in the middle of a plate. Pytkus showed it to Reitman and he felt it was unbelievable. Thankfully, this meeting took place on a day when Michael was there and he started telling stories of worse things that had happened. One of them being a time when he autographed a basketball for a catcher, then the catcher gave him all the signs but he still struck out. This would get written into the film so in some way, Space Jam is based on a true story. By far, the most difficult part of production was filming all the green screen work. Jordan worked with 6-8 to eight actors in green suits who acted out all the Looney Tunes and basketball scenes. While on set, animators would take pictures of Michael Jordan in action, then draw the animated characters on top of those pictures to help create storyboards quickly. This would help the film editors understand where the animated characters would be in relation to the shot. In regards to the Looney Tunes, legendary voice actor Mel Blanc had died a few years prior in 1989, so Warner Brothers needed to find new voice actors to represent the iconic characters while still staying true to Blank's voices. Billy West was hired to do the voices for Bugs Bunny and Elmer Fudd. West is best known for his voices on Futurama and Ren and Stimpy. D. Bradley Baker did the voices for Daffy Duck, Tasmanian Devil, and The Bull. Baker is known for his various voices in American Dad, Phineas and Ferb, Spongebob Movie, Steven Universe, Spectacular Spider-Man, Last Airbender, and so many other films and TV. West and Baker didn't ever think they had a chance to be in the film because Warner Brothers had their list of actors that were hired to do the voices. Thankfully for them, Ivan Reitman didn't want to use the other actors that Warner Brothers already had. West and Baker were called back in after their audition and were asked to record a few lines. Then they came back in for another call in to record some more for the filmmakers and this just kept repeating until they realized they were probably already hired for the film. Based on other Hollywood experiences I've heard of, it seems like they never tell you that you're hired, it sounds like you just slowly transition from pitches or casting calls to actually getting the job. Mel Blanc was known for improvising in his voice acting sessions, so to keep the tradition going, Weston Baker would also improvise a lot of jokes on the spot. In fact, quite a few of those jokes made it into the final film. The scene where Bugs and Daffy are getting Jordan's shorts didn't have dialogue, so they were asked to improvise some sort of conversation. Pretty much everything they say in the sequence was made up during the recording sessions, even these lines regarding Looney Tunes merch. Speaking of toys, you know all those mugs and uh, t-shirts and lunch boxes with our pictures on them? Yeah? You uh, ever see any money from all that stuff? <laughs> Not a cent. Mm, me neither. Another major actor that was brought onto the film was the great Danny DeVito to play the villain Swackhammer. Do you know what new attractions mean? Not the old attractions! New ones! Get it? That's fabulous, we have that. Keep going. I'm going. The original plan was to have 90s icon Dennis Hopper play the villain and have his character be live action, but for some reason that fell through and they went with a different route. My guess is that it was enough trouble compositing Michael Jordan into animated shots, so they wanted to save time and money. There were also little cameos from other known actors. For example, that woman is Patricia Heaton who played Deborah and Everyone Loves Raymond, and that man is Dan Castellaneta, the voice of Homer Simpson. Finally, that dog is voiced by the most popular dog voice actor in history, Frank Welker. You may know him as the voice of Scooby-Doo and Fred Jones. So that's pretty much how production went. Fairly straightforward for what this movie is. Unfortunately, if the filmmakers thought that production was difficult, wait until they saw what post-production had in store for them. With the film shot, Joe Pytka reached out to the digital effects team at Cinesite led by VFX supervisor Ed Jones who had won an Academy Award for his work on Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Jones agreed to do the film since he wanted to see what could be accomplished with digital technology when it came to crossing live action and animation. To give the impression that the Looney Tunes were more three-dimensional, Warner Brothers animators gave the VFX artists three drawings, a regular beauty illustration, a half-tone mat that emphasized the shadows, and a highlight mat that showed reflections. When combining these three images, it gave the illusion that these characters were 3D. With the film set to release in November, animators only had 10 months to work with the live action footage and insert all the animations for the film. Unfortunately for them, there were multiple composite shots that were extremely difficult to do. For those of you who don't know, compositing is the act of combining multiple layers of video to create one shot. An issue animators ran into a lot was that the footage Pytka shot was moving footage. 
footage. This meant that VFX artists had to manually track each shot, then animate the characters so it looks like they're moving at the same pace as the camera. Nowadays, there's a lot of great motion tracking technology, but in 1996, the software wasn't quite there, which meant that many times they had to do their best to make the characters appear like they're moving with the camera. The VFX team also had a lot of trouble with, oddly enough, creating a CG basketball net. To their surprise, they just weren't able to make the shots work. This required them to go back and film a bunch of assets with a net behind a green screen. They also filmed it using a cyber cam, which was a camera that shot 3D 360 images of the actors to give VFX artists the ability to take that render into 3D animation software. That's how they were able to achieve these shots of Wayne Knight and Michael Jordan. I'm also fairly sure they used that 3D rendering of Jordan for this climactic scene, which always looked really painful to me. Pitka wanted to minimize the number of special effects used on set. They animated over the live action footage, but something they didn't want to have to do is have the special effects dictate how characters behaved. Everything was done in real life with people in green suits so they could avoid using rigs. To transition between the live action and animation, Pitka had a few miniatures for the film to trick the audience by making them debate whether or not it was animated or live action. In an interview conducted by Ferris Wheelhouse, one of the supervising animators, Dave Spafford, who had previously worked on Who Framed a Roger Rabbit, questioned Joe Pitka's use of the actors in green suits. Spafford warned that they shouldn't have the actors in green suits be in front of Michael Jordan because when you key the green out, you'll be losing Jordan as well. Pitka supposedly yelled at Spafford and the two stopped working together on the project. Later in post-production, Spafford was asked by one of the producers to please come and help fix all the technical issues they were having. One of them being that there were important shots where Jordan was keyed out, just as Spafford predicted. Spafford agreed to take on the shots as long as they let him and his team work in peace without any producer hovering over them. Supervising animator Bruce Woodside was asked to come into then president Max Howard's office and learn that the film was in a rough place. There were many incredibly complicated animations to be done, but November was nearing and they clearly wouldn't have the film finished at the pace they were going. At this same time, animator Neil Boyle was asked to fly down on the next flight to LA to help out on the film. Being from the UK, Boyle needed a little more time before leaving his country, so he asked if he could fly the following day. As soon as he was taken to his hotel, he was asked to start drawing for the film even though he hadn't even read the script. Boyle thought he would stay in LA for three days, but that ended up turning into six to seven weeks. He and a group of animators were put to work in a porta cabin in the Universal backlot right on the other side of the Jaws attraction which led to them hearing the tour bus scream, oh my god it's a shark, every few minutes. Clearly the studio was getting desperate. At this point, Pitka wasn't really directing the animation. From the research I did, it sounds like he only directed the live action work and the rest was left to Reitman and the studio. To create the artwork, the animators would draw all the art in traditional paper form, then scan everything to a computer. There were 18 studios around the world simultaneously working on the film so they had to make sure they were all on the same page for continuity purposes. If animators needed to get notes, they had to either go through the painstaking process of overnight shipping their drawings, then waiting to receive feedback, or they would have to simply do a smaller version of the drawing so they could fax it over. Today, animators can simply email a scan and receive feedback within minutes or even seconds. For you computer nerds out there, to render some of the VFX, they use the computer with 16 CPUs, 4 gigs of shared memory, and 256 megabytes of RAM. As you may expect, the VFX artists would constantly have their projects crash, which resulted in them having to redo a lot of the work. It was so bad that Roger Kupalian, who did the computer character animation at Cinesite, said you could go get coffee after hitting the save button. For 9 months, animators would switch between a minimum of 12 hour shifts and would only get one day off a month. At Cinesite, they even had a human sized sketch of Bugs Bunny with a wristwatch and the delivery date printed on so they knew how long they had to work on the shot. For the shots of all the cartoon characters in the stadium, digital effects supervisor Carlos Arguello created a system that let him match character heads to different bodies. They would essentially animate a handful of people, then clone them and give them different heads to convey the illusion that there's an entire crowd of animated characters. At the end of it all, there were at most 70 separate layers composited in a one shot to make it look like Michael Jordan was playing basketball in a 3D animated room. Space Jam would end up having over 1000 composite shots which was the most for any movie at that time.
The film's score was composed by James Newton Howard, who did his best to honor the work of Carl Stalling, the man who composed a lot of the classic Looney Tunes music. Howard was brought onto the project after having worked with Pitka on the Super Bowl commercial. If Howard's name sounds familiar, you may recognize him from his multiple collaborations with M. Night Shyamalan, The Hunger Games, and co-scoring the first two Dark Knight films with Hans Zimmer. The movie soundtrack would end up becoming nostalgia fuel for the 90s. Ken Ross produced all the original singles they got for the film. Unfortunately, they didn't get the songs until the movie was finished, so during production, they filmed it to match other songs, which Pitka finds unfortunate because having known what the end of music would sound like, he says they would have shot some stuff differently. Specifically the opening of the film and when Charles Barkley is playing basketball with the girls. While the post-production team was working night and day to finish the film, there were a handful of developers doing something that wasn't common at the time. They were making a website for the movie. To keep it short, in 1994, then Vice President for Advertising and Publicity, Don Buckley, noticed the first movie website which was for Stargate. This gave him the idea to push Warner Brothers to start allocating part of the budget to create a site for their films since he saw this as the future for advertising. With the internet not being popular and in its infancy, stages, Warner Brothers were wary about budgeting for something that they didn't see much value in. But after a lot of convincing, the studio gave Buckley enough budget to bring on a web designer named Daryl Lynn Wace. The two would go on to make the first movie website for Warner Brothers, which would end up being for Batman Forever. The following year, Buckley was able to hire two more designers who helped him make the site for the 1996 masterpiece Twister. By the fall of that year, Buckley had a five-person crew and was ready to take on the ambitious ideas for the Space Jam website. Weiss and a man named Michael Tritter were in charge of writing all the copy for the site, but since Tritter had no interest in basketball, a lot of that old copy came out very sarcastic. The developers worked very hard to try and make the site as great as possible. They had a lot of great stuff on here like behind the scenes clips, production notes, character bios, access to screensavers and posters, the movie soundtrack, and even some games, which I'm not able to play since Adobe discontinued Shockwave. The website was nice for the time, but because not many people had access to the internet, it just blended in with the other movie sites. The developers all moved on to work on different projects and eventually went their separate ways. But in 2010, a Reddit user was surprised to find out the site was still active. This post blew up and the Space Jam site became a viral sensation. Two of the developers still worked at Warner Brothers and according to a Rolling Stone interview, an executive at the studio took down the site after it went viral since it wasn't a monetized asset. After a few hours, the two original developers who still work there were able to convince the company to bring it back. If you go to spacejam.com, it'll take you to the site for the upcoming sequel. However, if you add slash 1996 slash, you'll be redirected to the original site. And if for some reason you're anxious that the site will be taken down, there is a Twitter account called at Space Jam Check that will check every few hours to make sure this beloved site is still up. If you'd like to read a more detailed story behind the site, I highly recommend the Rolling Stone article Space Jam Forever, the website that wouldn't die. The film was released to over 2,500 theaters across the US and made over 27 million in its opening weekend. While many critics panned the film, legendary film critic Roger Ebert gave the film a three and a half out of four stars, saying, Space Jam is a happy marriage of good ideas. Three films for the price of one, giving us a comic treatment of the career adventures of Michael Jordan, crossed with a Looney Tunes cartoon and some showbiz warfare. Gene Siskel also gave the film a positive review, which was something that honestly surprised to me. Space Jam has since become a staple for pop culture in the 90s and as of May 2021 is still the highest grossing basketball movie of all time, ranking over 90 million in its original theatrical release. Not only that, but a lot of the merchandise has sold very well like the film's soundtrack, which was incredibly popular at the time. Fly Like an Eagle became one of Seal's biggest hits, which by the way, I just found out is originally from Steve Miller in 1976. R. Kelly also went on to win a Grammy for I believe I can fly. I also just found out that there's this really odd song at the end of the soundtrack called Buggin' with Daffy and Bugs rapping. 
really weird. To this date, not counting anything released for the sequel, Space Jam has made over 1 billion in retail sales thanks to the following it's gained over the years. Creative director Jim Riswald, who helped come up with the original Hair Jordan campaign, has expressed in interviews that he didn't like the film, saying, it's a marketing idea first, and the movie, maybe ninth. But that's okay. It made a lot of people smile, and we all know the world could use more smiling. After the success of Space Jam, a sequel was obvious, but it could only be done with MJ on board. A producer at Warner Brothers claimed they had signed Jordan to the project, so they started assembling a crew for the sequel. Storyboards were even started. Cartoonist Bob Camp was one of the artists in charge of creating the storyboards and character designs. The villain for the film would have been someone named Berserko. This character would be played by Mel Brooks, so Camp drew expressions Brooks had made in the movies and exaggerated them into cartoon characters. After a few weeks, Camp found out that the producer had been lying and Jordan wasn't signed on. Even though Jordan had fun being on the live action set, he found the green screen work grueling and declined the offer to do a sequel, causing the film to get immediately scrapped. Jordan would return to make seven commercials for MCI, a phone company, that featured him with the Looney Tunes. He also had a cameo in Looney Tunes back in action, but it's clearly a reused clip rather than something new, so I'm not counting that. With Jordan out, the studio thought about replacing him with other celebrities. Joe Pitka was called into look through a script for Space Jam 2 that would have had Tiger Woods. There are also talks of making Race Jam with Jeff Gordon from NASCAR, Skate Jam with Tony Hawk, and most shocking, Spy Jam that would have featured Jackie Chan. Chan's management even entered negotiations in August 2001 since Jackie Chan's adventures was doing well with young audiences. As you may be able to tell, none of these projects ever took off. Instead, Joe Dante set out to make the anti-Space Jam with Back in Action in 2003. Since then, there's there's always been rumors that a sequel was being made, but with each passing year, it felt less and less likely. As early as 2014, it was announced that the sequel would be made and star LeBron James. Six years later, now there's a trailer with a release date for July 16th, 2021. The director of the first film, Joe Pitka, has spoken publicly against the sequel, saying it's ridiculous to try and make a different movie out of it, claiming that there will never be another player like Michael Jordan. So yeah, I guess he's not involved with the movie. It seems that Space Space Jam was his last feature. After the success of the film, he went back to working on commercials and music videos. So yeah, that's the history of Space Jam. Even though it's no masterpiece, you have to at least respect the amount of work all the animators put into this. I understand that many have the opinion that this film is bad, especially the fans of the classic Looney Tunes, and I can't argue that they're wrong. But for a kid in the 90s, this was everything. Yeah, the movie was made to be a giant commercial, but it didn't matter. Behind the not so great acting, cheesy effects, and formulaic plot, there is an incredibly entertaining film with a great soundtrack. I'm excited I'm excited to see Space Jam 2, but I know it won't match the first one simply because I'm older now, so I'm not in that target market anymore. But I hope the new film will have a similar impact on this next generation. It is, after all, being produced by the incredibly talented director behind the Creed and Black Panther, Ryan Coogler. But I've been talking for too long now. What do you think of Space Jam? Did you grow up with it? If so, what are your opinions on the film now? I think it's a good kids film to pop in on a Friday night. Personally, it does the one thing I ask a film to do for me entertain. Da, 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 da. Well, with that wrapped up, I feel a need to go burn off these pizza calories, but there's only one way I'm willing to exercise. For those of you who've never seen the greatest the world has ever revealed, I'd like to introduce myself. Let's go! I'm out here making the mess. Is that the Monstars? Whoa, can I get a minute? Can I get a second to introduce myself? Whoa, y'all two stop like that. Whoa, wanna fall back? Hell no, it's how they made me. Yeah, I drive crazy, got it big, not a Yeah, yeah. Wait, my ego was bigger than that. I don't forget it, I figured they slack. What's up on a mission to get it all back? Look at the facts, look how far they came. I can't never go back. I mean that, I know y'all seen that. If not, why scream back? Get that picture, man, that perfect picture. Sick, cause I need that. I told you, I'm too real. Man, that's how I feel. I'm
stop it. Get some help.